Good morning, class. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I hope you told somebody about Jesus this week. Uh, and uh, if you didn't, I hope you'll try next week to do so. Uh, so, uh, how's, uh, how's it coming with reading your Bible through this year? I hope you're on, on time uh, reading your Bible through because it's so important that we learn the Word of God so that we have tools in our tool belt to use against the enemy when he comes knocking. Um, and speaking of reading the Bible through, our own time reading would have come across these uh, answers to trivia questions this past week. Uh, at what age was a Levite required to retire from the service of the tabernacle? Uh, they were able to serve between age 20 and 50. Uh, so uh, they had to retire from the service of the tabernacle as an active uh, priest at age uh, 50, but then they were uh, able to do other tasks uh, in, in God's service other than that. Then uh, another Old Testament uh, question, at what uh, what ritual celebration and holy day commemorates the night the death angel came through Egypt and took all of the firstborn Egyptians? Yeah, you know that as the Passover, the Passover celebration. Then in the New Testament, we came across the answer to this one. And I want to make sure I get this right. So let me go over here to the answers. Uh, the question is, what are the four things we are told to do in the Great Commission? Well, the four things we're told to do, <clears throat> let me read it to you. It's out of Matthew 28, verse 19, where it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, uh, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So uh, we are told to go to make disciples. The third thing is to baptize them. And the fourth is to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And we know from our studies in the past that those commandments are those two things that he told us were the most important. And that is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. All right, so that's our trivia questions. <clears throat> and uh, why do we study the Word of God? Why do we study it week after week? Well, that can be summed up in John chapter 20, verse 31, where it says, but these are written, talking about the words in the, the Bible, uh, and this is the Holy Spirit speaking through John, uh, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Okay, uh, we are launching a new series and I am so excited about it. Uh, 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 starting today, we're going to be studying each week for the, for the next seven weeks, this week and six more. Uh, the seven last words of Jesus as he spoke them from the cross. Uh, Jesus died on a cross, on the cross, I guess, I guess you could say, to redeem us, to redeem all of mankind, past, present, and future, to save us from our sins because he loved us. Oh, he loves us so much. And it's recorded in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that uh, uh, Jesus was mocked, he was scorned, he was tortured, he was condemned to death by Pontius Pilate and carried to the cross uh, in Jerusalem. And they nailed him to the cross and there he hung between two common criminals. He suffered an indescribable an indescribable death. Uh, and we commemorate that moment when we celebrate 
uh, Good Friday or our remembrances on Good Friday. But throughout the year, we also celebrate the good news that God saves through faith in Christ. Uh, so let's get into the first of the seven sayings from the cross. The first one is uh, found in Luke 23, 34. And you'll remember that uh, in the story of the cross, uh, Jesus had, had suffered terribly at the hands of the Romans, uh, being brutally flogged and then uh, nailed to that cross, his hands and his feet. Uh, he was an innocent man and he uh, uh, suffered that cruel form of death that historians can only sum up as the most humiliating, cruel, and wretched way to die. So he is an innocent man. He is willingly laying his life down and in the midst of this brutality against him, he says a prayer. It's a short prayer, uh, but the significance of those words uh, are magnified by the compassion that he showed in those moments and the pity that he showed his own executioners. Uh, Normally, Roman soldiers were unfazed by the death that they were perpetrating and the, and the dying that were hanging on the cross, uh, traumatized and exposed around them. Uh, but Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Uh, his own kinsmen, the, uh, the religious leaders there in Jerusalem, uh, were responsible to uh, uh, or responsible for uh, his death and it was uh, perpetrated with one of the most <laughs> the greatest miscarriages of justice ever perpetrated on any human being uh, and this they did to Jesus. Uh, these men are the ones that overwhelmingly and vehemently insisted on Jesus' guilt, even though they couldn't prove it in court. Yet they insisted, crucify him. Uh, even though they weren't the ones that were physically driving the nails that, uh, that affixed Jesus to that cross, uh, the apostle Peter says that they indeed were the men that crucified and killed him. Uh, even though uh, he says that it was due to their ignorance, due to their ignorance. So let's, let's ask uh, some questions and make some, make some notes here. The first one is, why did Jesus say, Father, forgive them? In that moment of torture, and anguish and injustice, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, he's indicating that it's their ignorance uh, out of which they're doing this. But he, he also says, Father, forgive them. Uh, here is... Uh, the Son of God. Here is the creator of the universe. Uh, we're told that in, in the book of John, first chapter, that there was nothing created except he, Jesus, created it. And he is one who defends the defenseless. Uh, we see that in his ministry uh, throughout his work and his life on, on earth. Defending the defenseless. Uh, many of us have been defenseless at times, but here he does not defend his own innocence or even return an angry word against those that are mangling him. Rather, 
the one who came to save, having himself been forsaken by God in these moments where he's taking on the sins of the world, he is found interceding for the souls that put him on that cross, pleading <clears throat> that they themselves would not be forsaken. Why did Jesus say, Father, forgive them? <clears throat> well, we need only look at the surrounding context of the scripture to see that there are several reasons for him saying, Father, forgive them. Let's look at them. First, it is who he is. Jesus, the Son of God, born into flesh in this world, lived a life without sin. By the way, he had no carnal nature because those uh, are the, the carnal nature is passed down to us from our fathers. Who was Jesus' father? His father was God. Uh, so uh, one, of, one side effect of his holy nature within his own humanity was the fact that he did not uh, and, and would not live within the bondage of things like resentment, bitterness, hatred, or even self-centeredness. His prayer, even though he was a prisoner, even though he was condemned to die, even though he was in the midst of being murdered, his prayer is the prayer of a free man, someone who isn't controlled by others. He's not, uh, uh, he's not resentful toward those who are doing him wrong. This prayer, these moments are moments of unadulterated forgiveness. Uh, in, in spite of a lack of remorse or even acknowledgement of their sin, from his offenders, Jesus says and prays, Father, forgive them. What love, what pity. Uh, uh, Jesus is described in Hebrews uh, this way, for it was indeed, and this is in Hebrews 7, 26, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. That's who could say, Father, forgive them. So why else did he say that? Uh, in addition to the fact that it is who he is, let's think for a second about it is what he does. Jesus himself was free from sin and its consequences is forever an advocate for sinners. He is always living to intercede for us. Uh, over in, uh, again, back to Hebrews chapter seven, verse 25 says, he ever lives to make intercession for us. Think of it, oh my word your name on the lips of Jesus as he's sitting there by the Father, speaking to the Father, saying, Martha's one of mine, Lord, Father, forgive her. Kevin is one of mine, Father, forgive him. Philip, Phyllis, they're, they're mine, forgive them. Interceding for us, that's what he's been doing for the last 2,000 years since this moment on the cross and the resurrection, he's been sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. It is what he does. He's the only mediator between God and men, and it makes sense that Jesus would do just that. Pray for those who had sinned against God. Pray for those who had sinned against him. If we are ever able to forgive those who sin against us, it's not because we're a good person, it's because that the God who 
is in us, is working through us to make it so. It's what he does. It's who he is. It is what he does. And then the next point is, it is why he came. Jesus himself said, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He came to do the Father's will. It is why he came. Jesus became a man and dwelt among us with a purpose. And that purpose included doing away with the excuse of ignorance. Beyond that, he came knowing that he would suffer and that he had to die for sinners. Uh, and the reason he had to die for sinners is because it was only his blood that could fulfill what was needed to receive the everlasting forgiveness of God. The innocent lamb of God had to die to pay the penalty for your sin, for my sin. It is why he came. This is the very forgiveness that Jesus was praying for from the cross, eternal reconciliation. Aren't you glad that uh, the stupid stuff that we do, the rebellious stuff that we do does not separate us eternally from God because Jesus came and he lived that perfect life and he died on the cross for our sins. We don't have to be separated when we appropriate by faith uh, and receive that gift that he gave to us in those moments. It is exactly what he was about in that life of his, that's why he came, to provide for us, not just for those that went before him, not just for those that were there then, but for all the world, again, past, present, and future. Jesus said, for this uh, is my blood, of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I will say that he didn't pour out his blood for all. He it was poured out for many because we do know that there will be some that reject him. There will be some that uh, don't accept that free gift of salvation. Okay, so it is who he is. It is what he does, it is why he came, and it is what God's people were waiting for. Uh, the, the, the nation of Israel had been waiting for the Messiah for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and by interceding for his transgressors through this prayer, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy that was foretold by Isaiah hundreds of years prior to his work there on the cross that he was experiencing in those moments. This prayer from the cross particularly would have been a confirmation of his identity to those who knew the Old Testament, for those who were awaiting for their beloved Messiah. Uh, and here's what Isaiah uh, says about him. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Why did Jesus pray this prayer? It's who he is, it's what he does, it's why he came, it's what God's people were waiting for, and it is what he taught himself. Uh, Jesus' prayer is one example of how our Lord was practicing what he preached. He didn't teach anything that he wasn't willing to live out himself, and I hope we're the same, that we are willing to teach and, and, and walk in what we teach. But uh, in this prayer, <clears throat> this prayer was an act of loving his enemies and praying for those who abused him, which is what he teaches us to do. Pray for our enemies. I hope you're doing that this morning. There are tragedies being perpetrated all around the world. 
One in particular is happening in Ukraine. I hope you're praying for both the Ukrainian people and the perpetrators. Oh, pray God's mercy uh, uh, on their souls. Are you praying for your enemies? You're praying for those that are against you, those that would hate you, uh, those who would, if they had the chance, take your life. Do you pray for them? Well, there are people in this world that uh, if you're a Christian would like to take your life as you are in their eyes an infidel. Uh, but we ought to pray. We ought to always pray. These are themes that we see repeated throughout the New Testament and on display in the life of Christ as he prayed in the face of this brutality against him. Uh, the last thing, it is our example to follow. Uh, in Ephesians 5, 1, Paul tells the church at Ephesus to be imitators of God. While this call of, of Peter's to us as believers is to be holy in all of our contact, just as he who called us is holy, uh, of course, we don't always live this out and we don't ever live it out in our own power. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit living through us uh, once we've been saved and, and as God brings us along in our growth and maturity uh, as we rely on him. This kind of fruit can be seen right away in the early church. Uh, I, I hope you've uh, uh, read, or if you haven't, that you will, Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. What stories of Christians who willingly laid down their lives uh, for the, the claim of Christ. I hope, you'll, I hope you'll do that. But that's evidence of the fruit that uh, is consistent with this, this attitude and love of Jesus that he was showing in these moments. Uh, Stephen, one of the first deacons in the church, one of the first servants in the church, uh, shortly after the ascension of Jesus uh, back to the Father, after his resurrection, uh, Stephen was being persecuted and he was being stoned. <clears throat> and as the stones were striking him and taking his life, he is heard to say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Someone has once said that that's a mirror image of what Jesus was saying. I, I think it runs much deeper than that. I think it is the spirit of Christ speaking through him in these moments. And just like Stephen, many others have, have been martyred uh, and Someone once said that Jesus went down that path first, and then we've watched others go down that path as well. And uh, someone once said, it, it appears that a path already taken is a path easier to follow. So in light of, 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 of Christ's death, in light of his uh, love for those that were persecuting him and mutilating him and murdering him uh, in light of the example that he gave us there. Uh, we, we must respond similarly to those who would abuse us uh, and forgive them. Now, we don't have to stay with the abusers. We don't have to uh, 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 invite it. But when there is damage done to us, we can forgive because he forgives. And Jesus told us not to fear those who can kill the body. Uh, don't fear them because if they do kill your body, then your soul is immediately with the, 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 the Father. Uh, 
And he said, blessed are those, blessed are you when others revile you. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Uh, Jesus, uh, I'm wrapping up this section by, by these words of Jesus where he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Think about that for just a minute that you love one another as I have loved you. Think about the love that he had for those that were nailing him to the cross where he said, Father, forgive them. They're doing this out of ignorance. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, he loved them in spite of the way they were treating him. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. That's the fruit of love. Closing uh, this thought out today. Jesus opened his public ministry with prayer and he closed it. If you look at Luke chapter three, verse 21, he was being baptized there by John the Baptist. And it says he prayed and the heavens were opened. So he opened his ministry with prayer. He began it with prayer. And here we see him on the cross and he's praying. And he's praying a prayer of intercession and that will continue through the ages as long as time continues. He's praying for you and he's praying for me. In our times of difficulty, as we pray for others, um, and there are some times that we get discouraged and we pray for others for a long period of time and it seems that folks get worse instead of getting better. Uh, don't give up. That's the work of Christ. He's interceding. He is interceding as well. Uh, you may be praying for an atheist. That may be a family member, a child, uh, a wayward child. Remember the cross. Christ prayed for his enemies. Christ prayed and people and, and, and his prayers made a difference. Now, um, I'll, I'll relate a, a, uh, uh, a, a time when we prayed for a man for 33 years. Um, we would meet every thir Thursday morning. We prayed for 30 years for this brother-in-law of my friend. And uh, then three years after that Thursday morning uh, uh, a prayer meeting ended, we were still praying for that brother-in-law and he got saved. Oh my, don't give up. Don't give up. And don't hold resentments against, against folk. It'll eat you alive. We must learn how to forgive quickly and thoroughly. Uh, and we'll close with this, with this story. True story. 1993, a mother lost her only son when O'Shea Israel shot him during an argument at a party. Her initial reaction was that she wanted justice. She wanted him to pay for this crime that he did. And he did. After serving 17 years of a 25 and a half year sentence, he was released from jail and when he was, he returned back to his old neighborhood and he moved in next door to the mother of the son that he had killed. And this was not by accident, but it was by a remarkable act of mercy. A few years prior to his release, Mary, that mother, overcome by conviction to forgive him, did so. And she set out to do uh, what she could through the course of several meetings. 
After some time, she was able not only to forgive him, but to help him on his departure from prison. In fact, they don't just live close to each other, they live close in spirit. Mary gives God the glory with her ability to forgive such a tragedy. Unforgiveness is like a cancer. It'll eat you up from the inside. It's not about the other person. Me forgiving him does not diminish what he did, but it releases me. Forgiveness is for me. And we need to know that. Forgiving others is about releasing that poison, that bitterness from within us. And it frees us. So let's forgive. Let's love our neighbor as ourselves, and forgive those who despitefully use us, who uh, do wrong to us. We must forgive. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for your example, uh, for those words on the cross, Father, forgive. Oh, may they resound in our spirit forever, especially when we're tempted to want to say, I will never forgive that. Forgive us, Lord, for our rebellion in not being willing to forgive. Bring us to the point where we can forgive and to release every resentment that we hold. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today.